I'm going to talk a little bit about our regulatory background, what laws we've got, what tools we have. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the risks and benefits, what we assess and how we assess them. I'm going to provide one example uh, for a chemical about the kinds of things that our office can do to regulate those risks to give you an idea of what we, what we do and the things we can do and maybe to some extent the things we can't do. I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about um, the information we use, uh, what our data needs are, and how the general community can have an impact on how we do pesticide registration and risk management at a national level. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about our regulatory context, the laws. It's a good place to start. The laws that govern pesticides. Um, and there are two main ones. The first one is uh, FIFA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And this is what the lawyers will tell you is a risk benefit statute. The exact words in the law are the pesticide should pose no unreasonable adverse effects to human health in the environment. And that unreasonable is what they take to be a risk benefit. So we get up. When we identify a risk, we weigh it bad against the potential benefits of the use of that pesticide. If it has low benefits, we'll tolerate less risk. If it has higher benefits, we may tolerate a somewhat higher level of risk. Our second main law is, the, is FFDCA as modified by a third law called FQPA, was the Food Quality Protection Act. For food, you don't get to do risk-benefit balancing. The words, and this is in the, the second of those two laws, FQPA, reasonable certainty of no harm. Um, there's no, you have to be sure that there's no harm and you don't get to balance that against the potential benefits. So if there's a risk from food, there's less tolerance at the national level, as Congress has told us, over how much risk we're going to tolerate. A couple of other changes that FQPA made were that uh, we need to aggregate the exposure over several different routes. We couldn't do it one at a time. We needed to look at food and drinking water and residential exposure. And by that I mean the exposure you get from uses around the house, on your lawn, a termiticide around the bottom of the, uh, the foundation of your home or within the home. So we had to consider all those exposure routes at once and we were also required to look at pesticides that have the same toxic mode of action. And the classic case would be the organophosphate pesticides like uh, diazinons, uh, an OP. They, uh, the toxic mode for all those pesticides is a set of cholinesterase inhibition uh, and they all operate in the same way. So we are required to look at the risks from those all at the same time, from all those pesticides. And it turns out to have been a very difficult thing to do. And we started those in 1996, and we got the first one done uh, last year. So it's taken us a while to figure out how to do that, but we're, we're starting to get those done. The quirk on FFDCA is if you don't have a food use, um, no tolerance is needed. That's how you regulate under FFDCA with a tolerance, and I'll talk more about that in a second. No tolerance, there's no need to worry about reasonable uncertainty of no harm or that risk benefit balancing. We have a few other statutes that we aren't the main guys for, but we do have to consider. Probably the biggest of those is the Endangered Species Act. We have to make sure that when we register a pesticide, we aren't going to hurt any endangered species. Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service is the main agency for that particular act. So we cooperate with them if we think there might be an issue for an endangered species. The Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act are administered by EPA but by a different office within EPA. The Office of Water. And we work with the Office of Water when there's a concern that those, those acts might apply to the pesticide program. Um, so, and to be honest, that is getting stronger and stronger, um, that link. So we'll probably see more of that in the future. I wanted to talk a little bit about the kinds of registrations and registration programs, at least briefly. <clears throat> the main kind of registration, and this is kind of the 
internal EPA jargon is called a section three. That's the section under FIFRA where this, this registration is described. Um, this is your plain old ordinary vanilla registration. We have a couple different kinds and we have really stand, uh, standard names for them. One is called a new chemical registration. New chemical coming in the door, it's a new chemical registration. If you've got a pesticide that's already been registered, but you're adding a use to it, we call it a new use registration. Uh, one that's a little quirky, we call a me too. If there's a product out there and somebody brings in a registration for another product that's very similar to the first product, has the same active ingredient, has mostly the same inerts, has pretty much the same use patterns, we call that a me too, because uh, this second company would also like to have that registration. Well, since we've already assessed that particular use in that particular product, it's very easy as for us to do that registration action. So there's a special category, and they're a lot less expensive than the other kinds of registrations. Section 18 is an emergency exemption. That, these are at, uh, state will ask for an emergency exemption, and it's for a use that's not on a section three yet. You don't have a uh, registration for that crop, for that pesticide, but a state thinks it might help with a particular pest, so they can ask for it on an emergency basis. But they have to have a, a section three pending or expected to be pending shortly to get an emergency exemption. The last type is uh, section 24C, and this is actually there to make FIFRA compliant with the Constitution. FIFRA is uh, comes under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Well, if it's a little time use and it's really local, that's not interstate. But we also want to have the registrations, um, it's useful to have them on a national basis. So this kind of fits in between. A state issues a 24C type of registration, and then we approve it after the state does. So this keeps us in compliance with the Interstate Commerce Clause. The last type is an experimental use permit, which you need to apply a pesticide when you're doing the field trials, the field experiments before a pesticide is registered. Um, there are two other registration programs I want to talk about briefly. One is re-registration, which will end next year. We've got just a couple more pesticides to register, but it started in 1988, so it's taken 20 years. Re-registration took all the pesticides that have been registered since the 1940s, a lot of which did not have good data sets, and it brought all the data that uh, are, is required to be submitted for our um, for a new pesticide, and that all these new old pesticides have those data sets up to that same standard. And then we reevaluated the risks and benefits for each of those pesticides when that data had come in. So basically, it was a reevaluation of all the old pesticides, and there were over a thousand of them to start. Um, several hundred of them were dropped out. People just said it's not worth it. I, mean, I believe there are about 640 that we of uh, these re-registrations we had to do. The last program is re-registration review, which is going to re replace re-registration, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Tolerances. These are not issued under FIFRA; they're under FFDCA. A tolerance is basically a license to allow a small amount of pesticide on a food item. Um, originally, a tolerance was a regulatory tool to show that either a pesticide was applied to a crop it shouldn't have been, or that it implied at a rate higher than was allowed on the label. So you analyze some of the crop, and if there was more there than the tolerance, there was an illegal residue and, and FDA would seize the crop. However, in 1996, when FQPA was passed, an additional requirement was added, and this was that reasonable certainty of no harm. Not only was there this illegal, it was illegally applied, 
if the residue was there, we had to have showed that it was safe to be there, that it would not harm people to have been 